Very quickly introduce me. Uh, my name is Jim Mason. I'm the uh, uh, founder and, and CEO on most days of All Power Labs. Um, I started this endeavor started out of what was originally an art space uh, in the other side of the building over here that um, was built for large-scale mechanical and kinetic art. Uh, this is an, a facility where a lot of the early Burning Man large-scale art, artworks got done. Okay. Um, and we built a large uh, facility out of shipping containers, um, put containers to, together to build buildings, knocked out walls, made shops, studios, what have you, and got in a, um, a rather pitched battle with the city of Berkeley over, over building code. Um, and their opening volley in the battle was to, to shut off our power. Um, and we were, we were unimpressed with this opening move and thought we were actually doing interesting things, reusing materials and um, kind of ecologically interesting, creatively interesting, so we fought them. Um, and while we fought them for the next six or seven years, we had to generate all of our own power. So a group of kind of creative, technical, engineering types that on the weekend were slumming um, doing artwork um, while doing engineering during the week, suddenly got very involved in power generation and conversion. Okay? And after a long and, long and winding road, I got fascinated with gasification, um, and slowly the art space has faded, or the build space has faded, and is now the, the, um, the biomass gasification startup that uh, you know and why you're here. Okay? In the interim, we went, ran the facility off-grid for about six or seven years. We generated all of our own power in the middle of the city of Berkeley. It's like a little libertarian tree fort in the middle of the nanny state. Um, they didn't like us very much, but however, at this point, they like us very much, and we're a poster child for what's called the Green Corridor through uh, West Berkeley, Emeryville, Richmond, uh, that is trying to, to have this be a center of kind of green tech manu um, uh, uh, design, build, manufacturing. Okay, so they're going to be coming, I believe, later tonight to issue us a proclamation about how what a wonderful contributors to the city we are. Okay, so that's our origin story. Cutting to the chase. Why, why are we bothering with all this? Well, um, the 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 macro point of gasification is um, it it offers the potential to connect the pre-existing energy system of the planet, which is photosynthesis, with the largest industrial energy system on the planet, which is internal combustion of some type, one type or another. Okay? We have a tremendous solar energy collection, densification, storage system going on globally. It's churning out stuff. Um, that stuff is often waste. That's a problem. We're trying to get rid of it. It's often free. Um, and inside of it, what, uh, you know, those are called plants, those are called organic debris. But inside of that, what it's made up of is the same atoms that we make up fossil fuels. Now the problem is that they're in the, the wrong form to actually be terribly useful. Um, they come in sticks and grasses and things and whatnot that don't really go down carburetors too well. Um, but Atomically, what is there in potential of energy, as well as the potential of transforming those into useful products, it's the same stuff that we're, we're making things out of fossil fuels. So the, the aha on gasification, or the big concept, is if you can get these solid materials into a gaseous form, um, you know, ma maintain their, their you know, recombine their chemistry, get them into various sorts of gases. You can now enter these into typical energy expression machines that we have everywhere and we fully, fully optimized. And those are internal combustion engines and combustion devices of one type or another. So um, we around here refer to this as the Mr. Fusion. Now the actual technology of the Mr. Fusion was, was not fully laid out, but Oddly, with gasification, you have the potential to make this thing approaching an agnostic converter. You put bad things um, into it that are all around us and free, um, and good things come out of it in the form of energy and various sorts of products. So we're trying to work on gasification as, as this bridge that moves between these, these pre-existing massive infrastructures. Um, the massive infrastructure of photosynthesis that's largely it's not producing oils and sugars. That's a very small portion of it. The cellulosic part is the huge portion of it. Okay? So we're trying to get a bridge between that and our, our internal combustion engine infrastructure um, and do that at a scale that relates to actually how energy is consumed in the end. 
Um, biomass is a very tricky resource in that it is, it, it's not localized. Um, we, we tend to not have very dense uh, sources to get it. It's very different than an oil well or a natural gas pipeline or a coal mine. You don't have density of sourcing, so it becomes very difficult to operate very, very um, large-scale um, plants to convert it. Okay? So we've really focused on trying, how do we get machines that go down to the scale um, of where the users are? How do we move the, mach uh, move the machines to where the fuel already is, to where the user's need are, um, um, is already is there waiting? Okay? So instead of a plant model where you're, you're siphoning up um, these you know, ancient stores of photosynthesis, um, we're trying to work with contemporary sources at small scales where the users are and um, deliver delivers services in a, in a distributed manner. Okay? So you get all that right, and then they write, write um, um, stories about you in the, the Liberia paper. Um, you see here. So uh, we were just over in Liberia as well as Nigeria. Um, there's going to be some reports on that later in the weekend. Uh, what? And Kenya uh, and Italy um, and soon to be Uganda. So um, uh, there's a very large project going on in, in Liberia to use these as, as um, micro utilities and uh, distributed rural electrification. Okay. Now taking a step back, um, the p gasification is one of many conversion pathways of biomass. Um, the, ma the materials and energy that are packed into the bonds in biomass can be extracted in multiple ways. Um, those ways, uh, and so gasification is not the silver bullet. It's not the way you always want to do this if you have a, a, waste, um, a waste biomass. Um, depending on the composition of the biomass, whether it's wet or dry, um, depending on what you're trying to get to out of the end, there's a whole variety of conversion pathways to work on. So um, this graphic here uh, tries to, in somewhat questionable graphic um, success, lay out the, ma uh, the main pathways that one can work on. It's divided generally, the laser that doesn't work, oh, here it is, okay. Um, whether you're doing, doing um, intentional farming to get to the thing or, well, actually, no. Um, this is uh, by, byproduct um, biomass or intentional farming. You have a basic distinction between the wet and dry processes. Um, in general, if you have a, a dry feedstock, um, it's attractive to take it through a thermal-based process. If you have a wet feedstock, one of the um, processes that are okay with water um, and sometimes want water will be more attractive. Okay? So on the wet side, we see things that we typically know, like anaerobic digestion for making um, uh, methane, fermentation distillation for, uh, for processing the sugars, and there's a variety of other direct extraction me me um, methods for, for um, components within the raw biomass. Okay? On the thermochemical side, um, there's a variety of things moving from very low temperature fracturing of the material, which is py pyrolysis, um, up through higher temperature and more complete combustion systems, gasification being a partial combustion, combustion being uh, full oxidation, releasing all the heat, and then a whole variety of uh, liquefaction processes that can either be direct or going through stages of, of gasification or a biological process combined with this, okay? Out of that, what you get is not one simple thing. You know, it's very similar to what we're, you know, the feedstocks um, and the outputs that we, we see in the fossil fuel world. Um, we get some, you know, in gasification, we're getting a gaseous fuel similar to natural gas, but some of these other processes um, uh, create oils, uh, solid fuels, um, you know, on this side, et ethanol, um, various sorts of relevant chemicals here. And then the thing that's not fully really shown here is all of the petrochemical products that you can create once you have the, um, the raw feedstocks. Um, the thing that uh, is in concept fascinating what you can do with a very mature biomass-based energy system is you can also engage large parts of the petrochemical energy system or the petrochemical product system. You can, you can use the, the feedstock of biomass once processed into precursors to build up 
um, various sorts of, of, of chemicals, um, agricultural fertilizers, um, 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 industrial chemicals that we are currently using fossil fuels to do. Okay? So the part that we're going to be dealing with in our talk is primarily this. Okay? And there's a whole variety of permutations in that, but of all of these things, all of which are interesting, all of which great work's been going on, um, this is the one that I found less tended, and if solved, um, had this massive infrastructure ready to be connected to another massive infrastructure, which is what we're trying to do. Very quickly, th this, this is a, a flow chart showing that within gasification or within um, the, the thermal conversion routes, there isn't a, a single route that gets to one type of gas. Um, depending on the process that you're doing and your feedstocks, you can get to various types of gases and oils of um, varying um, energy content. Okay? And those different, different products will be relevant for different types of end uses. Whether you, so whether you're trying to use an internal combustion engine or it's just process heat for steam or you need very high energy density gas to replace um, um, gases in a, in a pipeline or you need specific compositions to do gas to liquid um, synthesis. Okay? So by what, what, um, what process you pick and optimize, you can get to a whole variety of end products um, just within the, the, the thermochemical um, um, pathway. Gasification is fascinating um, in that it, it very quickly re reveals itself to be the operating system of fire. Um, it is a kind of uh, a, a low-level series of mechanisms and processes that um, um, combine together, usually invisibly within a combustion environment, that result in the thing that we call fire. Okay? Now, probably most of us in the room here um, have, have misspent youths of pyrotechnic adventure. Um, I, I have a particularly compelling one, um, and also combined with, with lots of engines and uh, general, general racing and boy machine sort of things. And all of those, you know, all of those things we find fascinating old things. We like fire. Uh, fire is a very compelling thing. But we often are de dealing with it as a... As a, as a uh, as a surface phenomenon, an end phenomenon. And what becomes very interesting about, about gasification and um, why I fell down into the rabbit hole so deeply in it is it really pulls fire apart. It shows you what's going on within fire and lets you just start controlling it for things that are more interesting than just making heat. And so I've ultimately learned more about um, um, uh, uh, combustion engineering and in, in, in engines from understanding gasification that I never ever learned from directly just working in uh, uh, engine engineering. Okay, So I want you to think what we're going to be going through um, in this gasification, uh, a series of exp explanations of gasification is trying to lay out these, these processes and underlying mechanisms. It is not one thing. It's a whole collection of things um, that we can combine in, um, in various ways and control what is coming out at the, the end state of the process. Okay? So these are the tools um, to tame fire. Okay? So I call this the, uh, the, 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 the down, down the rabbit hole into the, the four, maybe five rings of fire. Okay? Um, and I'm going to go from a simple to a progressively more com um, complicated explanation of how this works, um, starting with ring one. Gasification is most, most simply thought of as an incomplete combustion. If you have a solid or liquid fuel and you, and you, start it on, you, you set it into oxidation, set it on fire, but don't give it enough oxygen to complete the combustion. Um, you have heat that's breaking down that fuel. You'll have gases that will come off of it that are still, still capable of burning you can add oxygen later and um, get further combustion. So this is how we get like flames to come out the, the, um, uh, the exhaust pipes on a hot rod. Pull the choke, you get too much fuel that comes out and you light it on the end and the, 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 it's, it's um, coming out rich and now you get flames out, out, the, out the end of your beast. So you can think of a gas fire in some sense as a, an engine running incredibly rich. The point is to break down the fuel that you put in the solid fuel um, into these, these other forms, but not consume it inside the thing. 
you want to take that fuel away and go do something interesting with it elsewhere. Okay? So a gasifier actually runs at about um, uh, a quarter of, the, of what would be stoic for full combustion. So you're giving it about um, a quarter of the air needed to completely consume the fuel. Okay? So about three quarters of what's coming out of it is fuel that you can do something useful elsewhere. Okay? Uh, we can also see that in what's going on um, in a match or any solid fuel combustion. Um, we've all noticed that when you burn some solid piece of wood, um, the fire isn't down in the wood in the beginning. There's usually a little clear section right above the, the, the piece of wood, um, and up above that is where you get the colored flame and, and, and the heat, actually. What's happening there is when you, when you apply, when you light that stick with some other piece of heat, you start fragmenting um, the biomass and gases start coming out of it and those gases combine up above it with air, mix and then give you combustion. Combustion isn't actually happening down here in the wood at the very beginning. It's happening as gases up above here. Okay? So the beginning part of, of any solid wood fire or solid fuel fire is a gasification process that, that brings gases out of it and then burn over the top of it. Okay? As it goes along later, it starts burning the remaining carbon there or the charcoal, so you will start getting oxidation right on the material, and that's when you see the glowing orange um, coals. Okay? So, you can think of gasification also in terms of a match here. The goal is to start this process going that gets us a bunch of gases and then intercept the process and prevent it mixing with air, but instead stick a pipe right where that clear gas is, pipe that off somewhere else to, to do useful work with it. Okay? So, some other things that we see operate on a similar principle, um, a backdraft in a house. Okay? A backdraft in a, in a fire in a house is when you've had a huge amount of heat, it started to break down the wood, um, you fill the environment with, with uh, flammable gases, and suddenly um, something opens and you get, a, you get a, a big plug of air that comes in and the whole thing goes up. Okay? So solid fuel combustion always has this very interesting character. You have the solid thing you're starting with, but really what's burning is the, the gas and you, and you, but you can separate those, you can apply the heat to the solid, get the gases to come off, and then take those somewhere and then do other work with them that you want to do and control when you're adding oxygen to them. Okay? Now, um, the problem with that explanation of gasification as incomplete combustion um, is that, it, that it's wrong. Um, well, it's not actually wrong, but it's, it's, um, it's sorely incomplete and incomplete to a point that it's, it's not terribly useful. Um, so, as, a, as a, a summary of what's going on, yes, you can call it incomplete combustion, but how it's getting there is through discrete steps. Um, and those steps are called the, the uh, four stages of gasification. Steps are drying, pyrolysis, combustion, and reduction. And any solid fuel fire you, you see going on is participating in these four steps to, to varying degrees. Okay? Um, so I'm going to go through these. Um, I'm going to go through them in the order of what, what typically is easy to understand and the ones that are less easy to understand. Okay? Uh, drawing. Drawing is, is um, um, the easiest to understand here. Uh, drawing is you have moisture in the material before we can take it through any thermal process. We have to put enough heat in it to vaporize all the water out of it. Once we're going to get it up into combustion temperatures, that's all going to come out anyways. So the first stage, um, as the fuel is coming in through whatever the feeding system is, it's getting the water vapor out of the system. Okay? Uh, combustion, third stage here, is what we typically think of combustion. You have something that will burn, whether solid or, or gas. Uh, you add oxygen to it. Uh, you get an oxidation reaction. It's exothermic. It releases heat. Um, and so we get, we get heat and then the end products of combustion. Uh, which are always um, uh, water vapor and CO2. Now, the two processes here that, that people are typically not familiar with is pyrolysis and reduction. And so we're going to go through those um, individually. Pyrolysis is the charcoal making process. Pyrolysis literally means fragmenting with, with fire. Okay? 
If you take a piece of solid biomass and add heat to it, like, we were, like you saw in the match there, as the heat um, rises, you'll start breaking bonds in that biomass and um, gases will start to come off of it. Okay? As the heat goes higher and higher, if you have no oxygen, it'll progressively break off um, things in the biomass, um, ultimately leaving just the original or the, the fixed carbon backbone of that biomass which is part of the honeycomb structure that gives it its strength and what we commonly interact with as charcoal. Okay? So without doing any reactions in the biomass, just the application of heat will fragment it off into these different components. Okay? This happens because biomass is made up of approximately 20% fixed carbon, which is in general the carbon to carbon backbone in it, and about 80% volatiles. And the volatiles are a huge cocktail of different um, hydrocarbons and sugars and carbohydrates and, and whatnot. Um, that volatile collection, about 80% of the mass of it, um, is, much, is, is much less strongly bonded to the biomass than the fixed carbon in the biomass. So this is why when you add heat to it, it will break off because um, the, the energy that you're putting in through the heat will, will exceed what its bonding strength is in the biomass and it comes off um, either as a gas or a liquid. Okay? So as you start pyrolysis, the, the first things that are happening are, are is the heat is literally breaking off fragments of the biomass that can exist as gases. Okay? As the temperatures go up, those gases start to recombine and you get a whole variety of evolution pathways to a huge cocktail of different chemical species. Okay? But the first part of it is you're literally fragmenting the biomass. Okay? So um, when you're making charcoal, um, you know, the, the traditional method is you build a fire in a ditch, get a big fire going, um, and then throw a bunch of wood on top of it and throw dirt on that. You have a bunch of heat in there. That heat will, will, will heat the wood that's in there, but without air. Um, and that heat will start fragmenting off all of these, these volatiles with the gases coming off that we usually refer to as tar gases or, or uh, creosote or uh, uh, nasty, nasty smoke. Okay? So that charcoal making process is very dirty also, as most know. Okay. So in all of these reactors or on the gasification processes, there's a very early stage where we're running the raw biomass through, through um, pyrolysis and then using the outputs of that, the charcoal and the tar gases to then do something else. Okay? I don't know if I made that clear. That volatile, that volatile portion, once it breaks off, we call it um, collectively tars. Um, and there's many types. They can be liquids or gases depending on the temperature, but that whole section we refer to as tar. And, that then be, and it's also the section that becomes the great problem in the gas fire because they're all sticky, um, nasty creosote type things that you see in your, 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 um, your wood stove. Okay. Okay. So what happened? So here's a, a chart of what happens during pyrolysis. This is a, a mass change chart over temperature. Um, so up the side here we have the percentage of the weight remaining of the original biomass. It starts at 100 percent, and here's the temperatures in Celsius um, as we bring that that piece of biomass up to higher and higher temperatures. And this is assuming equilibrium that you leave it long enough at each stage that it comes to a total. It's total, um, uh, uh, or its potential for conversion at, at, at that temperature, okay? So in the beginning, we have the whole thing. Um, right when we get to about a, a 100 C, uh, we start um, vaporizing out any, any water that's in here. So this first um, mass loss is the moisture coming out. And as you see, you approach right around 200, you start to, to lose mass out of this solid, which is where the bonds start breaking. Um, and you have a very steep decline over the, the 200 to 350 sort of range that is the core area where pyrolysis um, can happen. And all of this reduction in mass here is what's coming off as the gases um, from the volatiles. Okay? Um, if you have infinite time, I and mean, this is assuming that it's getting to steady state, it ends, or you can get pretty much through all of pyrolysis by about 400 C and then it ultimately um, levels off to nothing. Um, you can run pyrolysis at much higher temperatures faster, but 
um, in terms of the raw energy amounts and temperatures needed to, to make it happen, it's relatively low temperature. And this is also why it's very easy to get houses to burn down, is that you don't need that much heat to start breaking this stuff down. Uh, the biomass also, uh, annoyingly, is, has a lot of oxygen in it. Biomass is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So pyrolysis, in, uh, in the beginning, requires heat to start, but once it gets going, it can start to produce enough oxygen from the biomass that it can be self-sustaining and ultimately exothermic. Above at about 350C, about in here, it's considered that, um, uh, about in here, um, that pyrolysis is self-sustaining, okay? Meaning that if you get it going and you have it in that temperature and you have it perfectly insulated or well insulated, no air can come in, it, it will keep consuming the fuel, creating more heat through the oxidation or oxidation that's supported by the oxygen in the original biomass. So that's how little sparks in a house can take off even if there's no air available. It's using the air in the wood. It assumes what's in the biomass. There's no oxygen in any of this. So all these processes we're, we're talking about have the feature that they aren't a bonfire. They're all air-controlled systems or oxygen-controlled systems. Okay, so this is assuming that there's no air. This is temperatures being added through some external source. There's no burning here. So you know, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm going to go through and isolate each of these processes, and then we're going to put them back together in a variety of different ways. So the isolated process of, of pyrolysis is I take... You know, I take a chunk of wood, and it's in an environment um, uh, of, of no air. And if we apply heat into that environment, into that wood, this will be the mass change. And this becomes very important later, because uh, pyrolysis, other than, yes, it has this, this, this is the general arc of it, but also the, the species that come out the end of it, what are the actual tar compounds that come out the end are highly variable. And that's something that we can control in the gasifier to, to help us in converting it downstream. Okay? So, of the four processes, uh, everyone knows how to dry things. Um, pyrolysis, everyone now understands, is going to go into charcoal, biochar making business. Combustion's obvious. It was the first thing we learned when we were six. Now, reduction. Okay? Reduction. Um, Reduction is usually the, the, the part of this that's most unfamiliar to people. Um, the, probably the easiest summary of it is that it's the opposite of, of combustion. It's the opposite of oxidation. Instead of taking something, adding oxygen, um, having an exothermic reaction that releases energy and takes that, that fuel to a combustion product, reduction is going in the opposite direction. You're taking... Um, uh, st the combusted molecules of uh, CO2 and, and water vapor, and you're, you're putting energy back into them, taking the oxygens off of them, so they have combustion potential again. Oxidation's adding oxygen, releasing energy. Reduction is taking the oxygen off of those molecules um, by putting energy into it, breaking them off such that they have potential to oxidize again. Okay? Um, the environment that we're doing that in a gasifier is the, the charcoal bed. Um, the charcoal, if you, if you take an, um, CO2 and water vapor over a red-hot charcoal bed, the charcoal is, again, the charcoal is all C. It's glowing red-hot charcoal. It's highly reactive. And it's actually more reactive to the oxygens that are sitting in these two molecules than the bond with that water and, and CO2. So if you take these um, feedstocks through the, the, the charcoal bed, the charcoal will reduce or fragment or react with the water vapor on, uh, um, through this reaction, um, which is called the, uh, the water reduction reaction. Water over red hot charcoal pulls the oxygen off, leaving the hydrogen alone, and the carbon in the charcoal takes that oxygen and makes CO. Okay. Again, that, that reaction is endothermic. It requires um, energy. Uh, it, takes, it takes heat out of the system that it's operating in. Um, it requires a minimum temperature of about 600 C. Really, to have any reaction rate, it has to be 700, 800 C or above. Okay. 
Um, on the CO2 side, similarly, if you take CO2 over a, um, a red hot bed of carbon, um, the C pulls the oxygen off here and further breaks the, the diatomic oxygen and tries to spread those oxygen atoms out to as many C sites as are available. Again, the C is more reactive than the other things that it's stuck to here. Okay? So in both of these cases, what some combustion event here, some hydrocarbon that oxidized with an output of CO2 and water vapor and released energy, we've reversed those now by um, taking these feedstocks over uh, an energy giving bed of charcoal with a highly reactive um, charcoal that runs the reduction reactions and gives us an output of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Okay? And this is usually the goal in the gasifier. We want to get an, to an output of our most simple hydrogen and carbon gases, which most simple hydrogen gas is H2. It will exist on its own at atmospheric conditions. And the most simple carbon gas, is, uh, at least we have presence of oxygen, is CO. Uh, carbon itself doesn't like to exist at a gas until things get really hot. I forget how hot. Something like 3,000 3, C or something. It's very hot. So if we want it as a gas, we have to combine it with some other things. Okay? So um, what we're usually doing in a, in, a, in a gas fire is setting up a situation where we, we, we create combustion get to these, these end products of combustion here, we create heat, and then take those products back over a charcoal bed that um, runs these reduction reactions and gives us the outputs that we want of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Okay? All makes sense. So, those are the four processes that you will see going on in any gasifier. Drying, pyrolysis, combustion, and reduction. Um, they're here and they're, they're um, you know, they're their temperature order, um, they, but actually the, the order in which these happen in different types of gasifiers um, move around. Okay. So any questions on that before I go to show how these actually work in a, a gasifier? So do the early gasifiers like during World War II, the gets, were they using the, the uh, reduction? Yeah, they're all using it. So I mean, this was at, these reductions were actually discovered in in, um, in steel making. They're very important for um, um, doing various processes in the in the the molten pool. Okay, um, so it's interesting to see. Like we usually think, well, how do you get to hydrogen out in the world? We usually think, well, it's an electrolysis thing. We're going to have to run electrolysis to break the water with electricity. Well, there's this other very interesting path of getting to hydrogen by using water. Using water and charcoal, we can similarly break this water molecule um, and get to, get to a hydrogen. Okay? We also have a CO here, but there can be later pro, um, processes that you can, you can um, catalyze this out um, and just be left with just the hydrogen. So um, in the unrealistic situation that you actually have a huge amount of, of heat and you have a huge amount of charcoal, you have a fantastic pathway to make hydrogen. Now, that doesn't usually exist in the world. but. Um, uh, I was curious to find that I had always considered hydrogen to be a you know electrolysis everyone's um, kind of assumed making method, and um, there is this direct thermal chemical route um, using very low technology to do it. Okay. Both of both of these are. I mean, both of these when you're when you're uh, when you're breaking these in reaction cross here, it takes energy to break those those molecules apart. Uh, the water vapor, I mean, they'll have different heat, heat carrying capacities too, so getting them up to the reaction temperature will, will um, uh, consume various amounts of heat in your, your environment. Okay, and I think I mean, the, main, the main issue with water is, is the, the heat of vaporization. Going from the liquid to the gas is where it takes all the energy. Um, ra does anyone know off the top of their head ra raising uh, one mole of each of these one degree Celsius? I would, water is probably more, but probably not that much more. What's the heat carrying capacity of CO2 versus water vapor? No one has the CRC in their head? Okay, it's more, we'll figure it out. It's more, but uh, um, it's, not, it's, not the, it's not the generation of steam, which is the main issue, okay? The main energy here is in the breaking of that over the charcoal bed, okay? So a, a gas fire is always putting heat into this charcoal bed 
uh, through combustion to get it to the reaction temperatures, as well as creating more charcoal as a reactant, as well as more gas as the feedstock. Okay? And interestingly, combustion provides the feedstocks you want, provides the heat, and if you do it um, cleverly, you also get the charcoal that goes in. So the output is the, C the CO and H2. Okay, so how, do, how does this work in actual reactors? So what we're going to do now is we're going to come back to these four processes and say and, and um, lay these out as to how they operate in real reactors in the world. Okay, and we're going to start with the most the most simple reactor, which is called a well an updraft gasifier using charcoal only. Okay, and we're going to start with charcoal because it it simplifies the process a bit and shows you how how the the the, the core. Um, importance of reduction in this. Okay, again, remember the point here is we're starting with a solid fuel and we want to get a gas out of it. Um, the solid fuel we're starting with is made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The most simple gases that we can get to out the end of that are hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Okay, um, I guess I should point out the obvious: carbon monoxide is a fuel. We don't usually think of carbon monoxide as a fuel, but it's actually um, a quite wonderful fuel. Um, it's very bad for us. Um, uh, but in term, engines um, are, are, are rather happy with it. Um, its energy density by volume is about the same as hydrogen. It has a flame front speed about the same as propane. Um, it burns incredibly clean because it's not a big molecule that has to be fractured apart. It takes one oxygen to go to the end state of combustion, like hydrogen. Hydrogen is a very clean burning fuel because you don't have this big long chain hydrocarbon you're trying to break. Just starting your feedstock is ready to react. There's no preparatory work. Okay? And ultimately, this is why gasifiers, can, uh, gasifiers that are powering engines, the engines can have very good emissions because the gasifier is like a big pre-combustor that's breaking all these complicated fuels down into very simple gases that have very short and simple combustion steps. So you get very clean emissions out of it. Okay? Now that assumes the gasifier isn't a disaster, which is the usual case. Um, so you, you have to not have the, the, the pre-combustor, the gas fire, making a disaster such that you can you know, put the instrument in the engine and, and feel proud. Okay? So um, in this case, okay, all, of, all of these thermochemical um, uh, reactors are assuming a controlled air environment. None of these are, are, are um, uh, open wood fires. None of these are bonfires. Though, you can also look at the, the, the micro scale of what's going on down in pores of wood, and you see permutations of these processes going on. Okay? But we're going to deal with this on the macro scale of we have vessels with tanks, lids, we're controlling where the air is going in, and we're controlling where the gas is going out. Okay? So imagine you have a, a vertical vessel here. Um, we have a place on the bottom for air to come in, and we have a place for gas to go out the top. Inside of it, we fill it with charcoal. Okay, if we bring a torch in here, light this charcoal on fire down in here in the base, we'll, we will, um, after a bit, we will get combustion here. Um, combustion is, of course, happening from the air. Um, as we combust, the minerals that are in that charcoal are going to fall out of the charcoal down here in the ash pit. Um, and they're probably going to slag and annoy us, but in principle, it's going to be ash. Um, but what happens up in here? The air is going to come in here. It's going to... Um, um, combust or oxidize the, the charcoal that's available here, propagating forward to the point at which it runs out of air. Okay? The combustion lobe here will go until there's no more air to support any more combustion of the charcoal. Okay? So there's a lobe limit or a distance limit before this runs out of air in the bed and it, the combustion has to stop. Now, while the combustion stopped, we also, well, uh, we haven't stopped the, what's the potential for reaction. At that point where the combustion stops, we have a tremendous amount of heat that's been generated by that combustion, and we have a bunch of CO2 and water vapor that just came from the combustion, and we have a whole bed of charcoal here that's now hot from the, these gases being um, pulled up through here. I'll remember, to start this, we're either pushing the air in or we're pulling the gas out. So there is flow through this vessel like this, okay? So what happens is air comes in, combustion propagates forward until the point that it, um, we've run out of air for any more combustion. Now the heat, the charcoal, the CO2, and the water vapor start running the reduction reactions. Things reverse. Instead of adding oxygen, releasing heat, we now 
pull the heat back in um, and release the oxygens back off of the, the material. Okay? You're, you're pulling the heat into the upper section. Now you're pulling the heat in, into uh, chemical reactions. We're now going to convert the heat that was generated down here, the heat energy, into chemical energy through the reduction reactions. Okay? So reduction and combustion are to an approximation equal and opposite reactions. Combustion propagates forward um, until we run out of oxygen. Now, now um, we reverse and now we mine that heat back out into chemical energy through the reduction reactions that we saw here. Okay? So we're coming in, we're burning to these two things, and at the point we run out of air in that bed, we have water vapor, CO2, carbon, um, and a ton of heat. So these reactions run, producing uh, our desired outputs of H2 and CO. Okay? So again, uh, the, the, the um, combustion and reduction in a, in a controlled tube are equal and opposite reactions. You can take a long tube, fill it with charcoal, start air down one end, the combustion will propagate forward until where the air runs out, um, and then th the heat and the CO2, water vapor, and the charcoal will re reverse that and start mining that heat back out in the reduction reactions, producing CO and H2. Okay? You know, and this is how you get into CO poisoning in a, in a wood stove um, in your cabin. So you get a huge amount of heat in there, um, lots of glowing red charcoal, and now you, you, know, you shut the vent and you no longer have enough air to complete, um, to complete the, uh, the burning of the gases that are coming off of it. So you get a little, air comes in, you get a little bit of combustion, and now those combustion products, the CO2 and water vapor, react with the charcoal, they reverse, go in the other direction, and pr produce um, CO and hydrogen. Okay? So, so, these are equal and opposite. One's an oxidation reaction, one's a deoxidation reaction returning us to the original fuel gas. Okay? Combustion is releasing uh, thermal energy. Reduction is intaking that thermal energy and making it chemical energy. Now it has the potential to oxidize again and release energy. Okay? Is this making sense? do something with it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the point of getting it to a form that's a gas that's clean that we can use in an engine is what we want to do here. Okay? So the solid didn't go down the carburetor very well. We'll see later that the, the pyrolysis gases go down the carburetor for a bit until you stick the engine. Um, but uh, CO and H2 are clean and bur well burning, so taking them through this oxidation and deoxidation step, we now get a, a clean fuel. Okay? I mean, th these are operating at, at, at close to atmospheric conditions. These, these aren't PSI, and these can be a couple inches of water. You're just trying to get flow. This is like draft pressures or vacuum. Okay, so you don't need, you don't need, um, you don't need pressure to make these, re these reactions happen, but you need flow through the materials. So the only pressure or vacuum you have is just to ma make sure you're getting flow. Yeah, I mean, in principle, you could push in enough air in there that the combustion load could propagate all the way to the end. Like the okay. Yeah, well, the bonfire um, is, remember, you have the gases coming. You don't have a limit, an air-limited situation there. But at, only at a flow rate where the air is getting all the way to the end would you prevent reduction from happening. Okay. As soon as you have heat in a charcoal bed and combustion products, you're going to get reduction. Okay, so it's dangerous in a solid bed if you have flow going through it, um, if you're trying to combust, um, that you don't have enough oxygen to finish it. Because the degree to which you don't have enough, it'll reverse and now start creating carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Okay, so you're getting fuel coming out the end of it. Okay, so let's add the other two zones. Uh, the previous example is assuming we were starting, starting with uh, charcoal. Um, let's actually go to, to raw bio, or real biomass. So if we have biomass, um, we've put the biomass in the top. Um, combustion's still starting on the bottom. Um, but as the gas is passing up through here, 
Um, combustion, as before, propagates until we run out of oxygen. The reactions reverse, mine that thermal energy to chemical energy down to the end of where the reduction reactions work, which is about 600 C. So at the end of, of reduction, we still have a bunch of heat. We have gas flow, but we can't produce any more gas. But we have raw fuel coming down on the top here, um, and that heat is now going to be used to run pyrolysis. Okay? And pyrolysis, of course, is the charcoal making process and a further gas releasing process. So pyrolysis takes energy to do, so it will progressively mine the 600 C or so flow that's coming through here um, down to the end of pyrolysis, which we saw on that chart was about 200 C. Um, pyrolysis will end about 200 C and then the remaining heat in that flow is drawing um, the incoming fuel. Okay? And if you have a lot of moisture in the fuel, you'll keep extracting energy down to about 100 C and the gas coming out will be 100 C. Okay? So notice in a, this is what's called an updraft gasifier. You've set up the zones in their thermal order. You go from the highest temperature to the lowest temperature zone. So everything, all energy that's created in combustion here is doing useful work. Uh, it's first the heat's going to reduction, now, then it's going to the next lowest process, pyrolysis, then it goes to the lowest temperature process, drying, such that the gas comes out as relatively cool, um, and you've had a very high efficiency of use of the energy that was released here at the base. Okay? The problem with this is the gas that comes out is a mix of a whole bunch of things. The gas you really wanted was what was right at the end of reduction here. That's the CONH2. You don't want the tar gases that came out of the pyrolysis zone because they're nasty and they're going to stick up your combustion device. And you likely don't want the steam um, diluting your gas and lowering your, your heating value. Okay? So why this is very efficient um, in the use of the heat in the base, uh, it's, it's, it's counter-optimized to actually having a, a clean gas coming out of here. Okay? Um, so these type of gasifiers sometimes get used for direct combustion things because you can deal with the dirty gas, but this is also why um, historic gasifier installations, which were often these, are incredibly smelly, dirty things that are still super fun sites a, a century later. Okay. Any questions on that? What's, the, what's in the dirty gas? I mean, what, what's the tar pyrolysis when you've got that going on? What's in it that makes it, the gases? You often have like 300 different species that are in there, and it's a huge mix of things. They are very sticky. They, they condense to liquids at about 300, 350 C, um, and when they do condense, they're very gluey. So um, it is what we refer to as tar. I mean, it's what you see in your wood stove chimney. It's what you see in dirty combustion devices. And you can't okay. Uh, you can't use it on, on any low temperature mechanical things. It'll get into all of the spaces between the sliding parts. Okay? You can use it in a direct combustion environment. You can, you know, you can um, just burn it. Um, but even that, if, to the degree to which you have to take it through plumbing or you have to take it through a blower or do any sort of, of distribution work with it, it's very difficult to not destroy those systems. It's going to gum all that stuff up. Uh, even if you don't build that up, just the stickiness of it now allows particulates and, uh, and other dirt to stick into it and you just slowly get a big artery collapse. Okay? So, um, an updraft, updraft gasifiers are, are also called cigarettes, um, which isn't typically realized. Um, what's going on in a cigarette is, is that we are setting up these various zones, um, drawing uh, drying pyrolysis, reduction, and combustion in the same order that we just had in that gasifier there, but we're doing it for the purpose of vaporizing the, the nicotine, but then running the rest of it try to cool the gas down so we don't burn our throat. Okay? So if you look what's going on in a cigarette, um, the end, uh, so standard, standard cigarette here, we have an air-constrained vessel, uh, we have biomass on the inside, it's reasonably dry, um, we have a, a a, uh, a, a gas, um, uh, what do we call it? A mode of gas device, which is the human here, puts lips right there and sucks. Um, so when you light the cigarette on fire, you get a glowing lobe there that we know. 
We get oxidation, um, air is pulled in, we get oxidation to the point um, that we run out. We can't get any more appreciably coming through the side of the paper. So at that point, the reactions reverse, go into reduction, and we mine that heat um, back out into the chemical energy of CO and H2. Okay? Um, so at this point in the cigarette, we have a reasonable gas fire that we can run an engine on um, or give you a headache. Um, CO is very good at giving you a headache, too, in combining with your, your hemoglobin. Um, unfortunately, uh, cigarettes would be fantastic if they stopped right there, but they don't. Um, that we have all of this other biomass here waiting, waiting for fun, and the first fun is running pyrolysis from about 600, 700 C down to 200 C, producing tar and charcoal. The charcoal ultimately is going to get burned out here. The tar is going to keep going in this direction, uh, which is our, our main problem with cigarettes. Um, so pyrolysis goes about 200 C. The drawing here further pulls, pulls the, the gas flow down to about 100 C, such that what we're getting in here is 100 C minus whatever your losses are through, through the filter to atmosphere. Okay? So I was shocked to realize that we actually have a, a, a massive global industry that's making gasifiers. Um, they're selling them. We sell them to people, and they install them orally and operate them with great vigor. Uh, and, and sometimes with um, yeah, unique vigor. Okay. So I don't know if this guy lived. Okay. So the, the tar stuff that you're seeing that you're dealing with in gasifiers is what's getting in your lungs. Um, um, and when you see the pictures of like what's going on um, you know, at late stages of... of of, um, of emphysema, um, it looks like the inside of a, of a failed gasifier. Okay, okay so um, updraft gasifier, very efficient, but the zones are in the incorrect order, so we, got, we get dirty gas. So what do you do? Well, the standard solution has been what's called the downdraft gasifier, which reorganizes the zones such that you're taking your, your gas after the reduction zone. The updraft gasifier, you, um, you end up taking your gas after the in hole into the system, such that you go through pyrolysis and drying. The downdraft gasifier reor uh, reorganizes the, the zones such that um, your drying and pyrolysis are isolated and we get our, our gas directly after the re reduction zone. Okay? So how that happens is reorganizing reor the zones into the order of drying, pyrolysis, combustion, reduction. These are no longer the thermal order, but they're really a chemical order or the order that gives us the clean gas that we want in principle. Okay? We still have a closed container. Uh, we're still controlling where the air comes in, and we're pulling the gas off the base. Okay? If you were to light this on fire and run it for a while, you would end up with charcoal in the base here, a combustion area here that is a combination of charcoal and tar, the heat from this combustion area is running pyrolysis up above it through radiant heat as well as kind of convective flow up in this environment. And you know, starting at the very high temperatures of combustion here, and progressively um, mining the heat into pyrolysis um, through the same temperature continuum down to 200, and then from above there we get drying. Okay? So what happens when we run this, we bring in air here. We combust in this, in this um, constrained hearth here. We will preferentially burn the tar gases that are coming from down here versus the charcoal, because gas to gas mixing, you can get much higher reaction rates than gas to solid mixing. So even though this is a mixed area of tar, or excuse me, tar gas and solids, we'll mostly burn the, the tar. So air comes in, we combust the tar. That combustion load propagates forward until the point that we run out of oxygen at which point the heat, CO2, and water vapor um, now start reacting with the charcoal, running the reduction reactions, which mines that heat back into chemical energy as it goes towards the end of your charcoal zone, giving us the H2 and CO coming out the end. Okay? So this is like the first two steps of the updraft. It's just now the gas is not, not going out and going py through pyrolysis. Okay? In what? From, in Here? The combustion zone, it actually doesn't burn up in there. So, 
a ratio of it burns, and it's a problem that they're mixed, and we'll get, we'll get to that later. But yeah, it does pass through, and it's only because the, the, the gas to gas reaction is so much faster than the charcoal that you end up with any charcoal down here to reduce, okay? Otherwise, it'd all get consumed, okay? Whereas you saw in the updraft, all you're burning in the updraft is, is charcoal. There isn't any tar gas here. The tar gas isn't made till up here in the, in the pyrolysis zone. Whereas in the downdraft, you have both tar gas and char that you're, you're dealing with in the combustion zone here. So you're getting some mixture of, of um, burning those two. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the big problems in it. Okay? Now, the heat to run pyrolysis and drying, again, is not coming from the gas after it did useful work here. It's coming from the combustion zone. It's sitting here as a parasitic load on your combustion. Okay? Um, so again, through radiant and convective transfer, we'll, have part, we'll, we'll consume part of our combustion heat not to do the work of reduction, what we really wanted to do, but rather the work of pyrolysis and drying. Okay? Um, so thermally, these are much less efficient because we don't get to do anything useful with all the heat and this gas coming out here, but we're getting a much cleaner gas because we didn't let this stuff just go straight to the end. However, to get it to, to not have these messes coming through, we have great sensitivity in the geometry here of how we make this hearth. We're trying to make a constricted area that we're, f that we're forcing all of the tar gas through a very tightly controlled area such that it all combusts or it all gets consumed in this heat. Okay? If you make something that's too wide or it has, it has holes around or spaces or, or whatnot, you can get tar gas that passes around the heat and then comes out through here just like it did in the updraft. So this is why when people are you know, designing updraft or downdraft gas fires, all the discussion is, like, is on the dimensions of this hearth, what's the, what's the diameter, the lengths, how many air nozzles, what's the nozzle size, what's the flow rate, how do I make this combustion lobe that fully fills that area such that all of the tar gas is going to get consumed. Okay? You also have the problem that all, all that tar gas, its only way out is through here. Um, and same thing with the drawing zone. So if you put a very wet fuel in here, unlike the, the updraft where it just goes out in the gas, in the downdraft, it has to come down through combustion. Okay? So if you put a very wet fuel in here, you now have a huge water load, load, load up here that you're forcing through your combustion area and dropping your temperature. Okay? And so this is why downdraft gasifiers are, are so sensitive to, to moisture, whereas an updraft isn't. It's because the water vapor in, in the closed system is going to be forced down through the, com the, combu excuse me, the combustion area. Okay, so very efficient, or excuse me, very inefficient. We're not using the, the heat, but um, um, cleaner because we're driving the pyrolysis and drying um, down through the, the combustion zone, okay? And this is the, the standard arrangement of a, a fixed bed downdraft. Um, this is what you see, you know, the classic um, World War II em Embert gasifiers um, that came many different manufacturers. There's permutations of this called stratified downdraft or open top ones that um, have the zones in the same order but don't control where the air in comes in as much and actually because of that have much greater tar problems so they're easier to make. Um, but this basic arrangement of zones is standard in any downdraft you see, and it's what we're using on ours, though, with all of those zones pulled apart um, uh, for heat exchange. So that's what I'll show you next here.